Hello, Pattern Readers, and welcome to part 12 of the Great Hunt Reread. This is going to be a fun one because Rand and company go through the portal stone, and we get to see all of Rand's visions when he does. Are you ready for what might be? Flicker, 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 flicker. Chapter 35, Steading Sofu. Rand and the party ride for a day and a half towards Steading Sofu. Varen suddenly stops and looks around. Rand follows and he feels a chill pass through him, a sense of loss and a sudden feeling of being rested. Everyone reacts in turn as they pass the border into the Steading. A young female Ogier appears and Loyal scrambles off his horse to introduce them. She welcomes them and calls herself Aerith, daughter of Eva, daughter of Alar. Aerith asks Varen to leave some of the armed men outside of the steading, and she will lead the rest to the elders. Of the Shinarans, only Ingtar and Huron continue on. Loyal comments to Rand that Aerith is beautiful and that her voice sings, which makes Matt snicker. Loyal explains about the longing that comes over Ogier if they stay outside of a steading long enough, but says he does not need to stay here. They reach the great trees, which are enormous, and more Ogier appear, singing. They discover that there are three human women there as well, Aiel, Maidens of the Spear. When the maidens see Shinarans, they begin to veil themselves, and Ingtar responds by drawing his sword. Rand, Perrin, and Huron start to follow him and draw their own weapons, while Aerith, Varen, and Loyal shout for this to stop. And Matt's about to ride off on his horse, refusing to shoot at women. Rand reaches for Sidene and realizes it's not there. A male Ogier appears, admonishing them all and reminding the maidens of something called the Pact. The maidens uncover their faces, abashed, and everyone else puts away their weapons. The Ogier leads Varen to the elders. Rand notices the maidens glaring at his sword especially. Perrin and Matt tell Rand about the other Aiel they met, who were looking for someone called He Who Comes With the Dawn, who they believe is Rand himself. Aerith takes the rest to rooms for human guests, and they are brought water, towels, food, and wine. Huron is glorying in the sweet-smelling air, but Loyal is looking supremely uncomfortable. He's worried that the Ogier women will try to marry him off to settle him down. He explains that in Ogier culture, mothers choose wives for their sons who have no choice in the matter. And once married, his wife would decide whether he should be allowed outside of the steading. Matt scoffs, saying human men do the choosing. Rand frowns, reflecting on his experience with Egwene, and decides that actually they do it pretty much the same way, with men not really doing anything that their wives disapproved of. Matt stops grinning. At that moment, they are told that the rest of them will be brought before the elders. Chapter 36, Among the Elders. Loyal is growing more and more anxious as they walk through the Ogier town. So when they reach the door to the elders, Rand suggests he wait outside, and Loyal agrees gratefully. The rest of them go inside of a very large mound in the ground and find a large windowless room with seven old and dignified Ogier and Varen sitting in front of them. One of the Ogier elders named Alar introduces herself and says that Varen has made their request to use the Waygate. She requests that another Ogier be brought forth. He's a middle-aged Ogier man and he's vacant-eyed and drooling. She says he was one of the last Ogier to travel the ways, and he came out like this. Varen touches him and says that he is empty. One of the other elders says that he is without a soul. Varen says they understand the risks, but have to take the chance anyway. The elders agree, but begin to object to Loyal going with them. Rand interjects and says they need him. The others back him up, and... The elders agree, noting that Rand is to Viren, but they extract a promise from him to see that Loyal is safely returned to Steading Shanghai. Outside, Rand assures Loyal that he can come with him, and he notices Loyal holding a flower. Loyal says that Aerith gave it to him, and he presses it into his book. Matt laughs again about Aerith calling Loyal handsome, but Perrin turns the joking back around on Matt. 
The group moves toward the waygate, and when they arrive, Rand notices he can feel Saeedin again. They are outside the steading. They prepare themselves, and Varen plucks the Avendasaur leaf from the waygate. As soon as it begins to open, Rand can see and hear that Machin Shin is waiting again, and he orders it closed, which Varen does. Varen is puzzled that the Black Wind should be waiting for them twice now, and Alar has never heard of this. Rand wonders if Fane could have ordered it. Ingtar wants to head back to Kyrian and question Barthanis, and Perrin suggests another waygate. Varen suspects that any waygate they found, they would find the same thing. Kieran mentions portal stones, but Varen knows of none closer than the one Rand used in Kinslayer's Dagger. Rand says he can find it, but Alara tells them she knows of one closer. Varen says she can use it and asks for them to be led there. Chapter 37. What Might Be they do not have far to ride before they come to a weathered stone column. Varen bids farewell to the Ogier and give them thanks as they depart. Ingtar is still expressing doubts about going to Tomon Head, but Varen cuts him off and he agrees to go. Varen asks Rand to join her at the column. She tells him when they're out of earshot that she has never used a stone before. She only knows enough to help him use it again. Varen explains that the symbols at the top are for other worlds, and the symbols at the bottom are for other stones in our world. She shows him one of the symbols she does know, the one for Toman Head, and explains that it was once possible to travel from one stone to another in our world. Going back to the symbols for different worlds, she says she knows nothing, and some of them are dangerous. There is a gamble involved, and Rand must be the one to choose. Rand wonders why she is willing to take this risk. She says he is the Dragon Reborn, and she does not think the pattern will let him die until it is done with him. Rand denies this, but she prods him into choosing. She tells the others to come nearer. Varen touches the stone, but looks at Rand. Rand draws the power into himself and into the symbol he has chosen. The world flickers. Rand sees himself back on the farm with Tam, and a Trolloc runs him through with a sword. He hears a voice in his head saying, I have won again, lose Theron. Flicker. Rand struggles to hold on to the symbol he has chosen and is dimly aware of Varen's voice. Flicker. Rand sees himself married to Egwene for long years, never leaving the two rivers, while she tends to his sickness. After she dies, his wasting sickness worsens. He hears dire news of the world outside and takes up his bow to meet the Trolloc invaders. He is killed by a Trolloc on the bank of the Tarin River. I have won again, lose Theron. Flicker. The arrow and circle symbol that Rand chose contorts into the wavy line symbol for Toman Head. Flicker. Rand sees himself mourning Egwene's death a week after their wedding. He leaves the two rivers with Tam's sword and meets Min. He becomes a queen's guard to Elaine. False dragons tear the world apart. Rand discovers he can channel and a wasting sickness comes upon him, but he does not care. He defends Elaine against Shan Chan invaders, using the power in a battle where he is killed by a lightning bolt. I have won again, lose Theron. Flicker. Rand struggles to hold on to any symbol as Varen finishes screaming. Something is happening. Something is not right. Something is wrong. Flicker, 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 flicker. Rand sees more than a hundred lives in which he lives as everything from a beggar to a king, some in which he proclaims himself the dragon reborn, and some in which he dies never knowing he can channel. He marries Egwene, or she gentles him as the Amarlin seat, or kills him in mercy. He loves other women, including Elaine and Min. Rand loses the void and becomes aware of the others around him, looking shocked or miserable. Varen tells Rand it was a surge of the One Power, and they all saw lives they might have lived if they had made different choices. Rand looks around, and it appears they have arrived in Toman Head, but it also appears to be about four months after they left Steading Sofu. Varen urges Rand to let her guide him so that he does not kill himself or the rest of them. Ingtar vows he walks in the light, he will find the horn and pull down Shialgul's power. Varen soothes each of them one by one. Matt tells Rand he would never betray him. Perrin says that they have few choices. Some things are the same no matter what they do. Matt is anxious that they have come too late, but Rand assures him that Thane will still be there. Varen offers aid to Rand and he refuses. They ride west. The remainder of this video contains spoilers for the entire Wheel of Time series. If you do not want to be massively spoiled, stop here or proceed at your own risk.
Right before the party enters the setting, Perrin is questioning Loyal about whether wolves would enter, and Loyal says it is only Shadowspawn who are reluctant. So I was curious about dark friends, and it turns out we are told that dark friends who are really deep in the shadow would be uncomfortable entering a setting. Now, there's nothing in these chapters to indicate that Varen or Ingtar are uncomfortable while they're in there, although Varen probably doesn't like it as a channeler. But this makes sense with what we find out about them later. Neither one of them is truly committed to the shadow. The encounter with the Aiel is another way to show Rand's connection to them and to set up He Who Comes with the Dawn. But their particular loathing for Rand's sword is also another little seed or hint for the Aiel's history that we'll eventually find out. The reason that Varen can tell that the Ogier trial, trail, is soulless has nothing to do with the one power. We are later given information that explains that the loss of a soul is detectable without channeling. For instance, in Winter's Heart, when Perrin is in the wolf dream too deeply, it is said that he is cold to the touch, like someone who had lost his soul. Varen's statement to Rand to get him to help her with the portal stone is, you have been transported by a portal stone more recently than I. She clarifies to Rand that she has never used one, but she considers this to be why your use is more recent than mine. Just a fun little example of Aya Sedai twisting the truth into knots. In Rand's visions, when he uses the portal stone, we get hints of his romance with Elaine and Min, Egwene becoming the Amarlin seat, and Rand's Aiel heritage. We don't see what anybody else sees, but it's obviously an intense experience for all of them. Masima actually weeps, and we get the strongest hint yet about Ingtar when he feels the need to proclaim, I walk in the light, after his visions. Since this is an ogier focused section, let's talk about Loyal. Loyal continues to be a really delightful mix of sweet, genuine humility and a fervent adventurer. He's so anxious being among his people over the thought that he might not be allowed to continue traveling with his friends and being involved with the events that are shaping the world. But we also get to see him have a meet cute with his future wife, Aerith. And it's just adorable to see him taken with her beauty and keeping the flower that she gives him. And Loyal is apparently a bit of a looker among the Ogier because it's mentioned a few times the Ogier women noticing him. Probably the cutest moment was when Aerith mentions a talented tree singer from Steading Shangtai that she has heard about. And we know it's Loyal, but he doesn't say anything and he gets all embarrassed and blushes. The conversation about Ogier culture and women making the major decisions about marriage and men having no say is interesting. Robert Jordan seemed to have been making a little bit of commentary here that whether a society is considered matriarchal or patriarchal, that women ultimately make these kinds of familial decisions. I don't think I agree, but to be fair, the two societies in the actual conversation here, Ogier and the Two Rivers, neither one of them is actually patriarchal. The Ogier appear to be an actually matriarchal society, where the Two Rivers is actually fairly balanced. But the contrasting reactions of Matt and Rand to learning about how things work among the Ogier is fitting for their characters. Matt tries to make a joke, and he also displays his lack of awareness for the actual gender dynamics in the two rivers. This is fitting for his tendency to think things about himself that don't match with reality. Rand, by contrast, cuts through that to recognize the similarity they have to the Ogier. Rand has always been more penetrating and astute about these kinds of things. The only way that he's really pretty dense is when it comes to figuring out that women are flirting with him. It's his really big blind spot, when in most other cases, he's actually pretty observant. The trip through the portal stone is really a foundational moment in the series. First of all, we get introduced to the very concept that infinite possibilities exist for how our lives could go based on the choices that we make. This shows that for the average person, a significant amount of freedom does exist within the pattern. But with Rand's visions and also with Perrin's comment that whatever happens, whatever we do, some things are almost always the same. We also understand two other things. First, 
for anyone, there's likely to be a few core, nearly inescapable facts of their lives, things that they can't really run from. In Rand's case, we see that his channeling is what shapes most of his visions. And if we go a layer deeper, we consider that for someone like Rand and someone like Perrin, they're going to see even more commonalities in their many lives because they are Taviran and the pattern is weaving them more tightly. An example of this is when Rand tries to choose a symbol that would take him to another world. And he experiences this surge of the power that basically forces him to use the Toman head symbol instead. The pattern is basically forcing him to the choice that it needed. So even though it seems like they arrive on Toman head much later than they should have, in reality, they're arriving exactly when they needed to. So there's actually a fair amount of Rand, Matt, and Perrin making fun of each other and loyal too, which is actually heartwarming because this is what friends do and we get precious little opportunity to see this as the series goes on. But Matt seems to think it's hilarious, the idea that either Aerith or Loyal would be attractive, which is really quite speciesist of him. So I'll give props to Perrin for turning it back on Matt, saying no one ever said he was handsome. Matt tries to use Marisa Ayellen as a witness, and Perrin lies and says she has a face like a goat. That last part is questionable humor, but this is how guys talk to each other, and it was a lighthearted moment, which I did appreciate, especially Matt being taken down a peg, which he did need at that moment. I also find it randomly very funny that Varen's father apparently used the expression, it's time to toss the dice, which of course ends up being Matt's signature phrase. It's just a very random connection there, which I did not remember from my previous rereads. What did you guys think about these chapters? I love the portal stone flicker sequence, and I really hope the Wheel of Time TV show finds a way to keep it in. But maybe you think it's too complicated. Let me know in the comments. Next up will be chapters 38 through 40, and we'll return to the White Tower and then learn in an all too personal way about Damane.